Hey friends, I hope you're doing all right. I was not planning on recording a video today, but I just saw a clip I got on Facebook and somebody on one of the groups that I followed posted this video that I'm, I'm about to play through for you from California Pacific Annual Conference. And it was just so helpful, I think, in kind of portraying so many of the different forces at work right now. And um, I, I, I would encourage you to stick with me, even though I'm not going to be able to give a lot of the same background that I usually do. Usually I can talk about some of the personalities and local churches uh, that are involved. This is just going to be three faces, none of which I can tell you much about. I could maybe talk about uh, Bishop das, Dottie Escobedo Frank. Um, she's, she's the new uh, bishop of the California Pacific, Pacific annual conference, but I, on my spreadsheet, and a lot of you have seen my spreadsheet, I usually have lots of stats on each annual conference. The stats that C, C, uh, GCFNA had on this annual conference, there's no way that they were true, so I just deleted them. The, the only figures that I know are true are uh, between 2019 and 2021, the number of churches declined 3.52%, which is on par, really, with, with other annual conferences. That's nothing especially uh, exciting. Now, Bishop Dottie Escobita Frank, everybody knows she's liberal. She leans left um, in all the ways that matter to the left. So um, this is her pre presiding over this annual conference. I'm going to just play a little bit of this clip at a time and talk through it, and uh, by the time it's over, you'll understand why it's so uh, in uh, instructive, so helpful in illuminating what's going on right now. So uh, enjoy. Microphone three. Hi. Um, Bishop Dadi, thank you for this opportunity, to keep, uh, giving me this opportunity to, to speak. My name is Helena Kim. I'm Can a member of- Can you tell us your name and your church? Yes, I will. My name is Helena Kim. I'm a member of Mem Bell Memorial United Methodist Church in the East District. And I stand here with a very heavy heart because my church is faced with a severe injustice. And that injustice inflicted on us by our CalPAC conference itself. And let me explain. My church has decided um, by, um, uh, to disaffiliate from uh, United Methodist Church. We held our church conference. We had unanimously passed, but we are facing a roadblock, huge <coughs> obstacle. And that obstacle is placed by CalPAC conference uh, because it's demanding that 50% of the property value be paid as a condition for disaffiliation. Many people are... So I'm just in awe of this woman because it's obvious she's not English first language speaker. She speaks English just fine, but you can just tell. Uh, I'm, I'm quite certain this this woman is Korean. Um, this this uh, section was posted by a Korean friend of mine. And um, can you imagine what it's like getting up as an ethnic cultural minority in the midst of hundreds of people and saying, you guys are wronging us. I just really admire this lady for doing this. Not aware of this, and we are in a dismay, and this is an impossible. I mean, you know it, I know it, everyone knows that this is an impossible condition to fulfill. And CalPAC has always been in the forefront of fighting against injustice, and, but the fact is, CalPAC is inflicting this injustice on us. The handful of churches that are trying to disaffiliate. So she's throwing it in their face. She's saying, you're all about eliminating injustice. This is so unjust. We all know it. Like, the, the emperor has no clothes. You guys, in case you didn't catch it, this annual conference is one of just a handful, I think there's only two or three, that have a 50% property value added on to the fee of leaving, which is just not possible. And you might feel okay about doing it to some upper middle class Anglo church, but when you realize this is hurting ethnic minority churches, then that is a very different uh, image in your mind when you realize that there is an Anglo, far left progressive uh, minority that's taken over and is now oppressing ethnic minorities, uh, generally socioeconomically not as privileged, generally um, fish out of water in, in environments like this. When you realize that, that this is the impact that it's having, there is um, 
uh, it's just a powerful image to promote. So uh, kudos to this woman. Right. Making it impossible. So we, I come before you, uh, Bishop Dadi, just uh, pleading with you to, um, to allow us to speak with you, have conversations, and you and the, um, the conference BOT and the, the conference leadership team, and make it, you know, uh, come up with a, a term that, uh, is, that will enable us to work with, because this is not going to work. Uh, and uh, uh, the truth is, other conferences are allowing churches to leave. About more than 6,000 churches have disaffiliated successfully in other uh, conferences, but for reasons that are not explained, uh, to so she's also throwing it in their face that look, this denomination's in in free fall. Six thousand churches have made it through very hard processes and other annual conferences. We want to do the same thing here. A lot of people want out. Let us out. So this, I think, this message that uh, and she she's not reading off a script or anything. Her spirit is so right as she's presenting this. This cannot be, this is unworkable, but she's not being hostile. It's just the things coming out of her mouth highlight the injustice of it so perfect. I don't know that anyone could do a better job than this lady does. I'm just in awe of her. To us, uh, CalPAC conference is demanding conditions that's just uh, impossible to meet. It's unjust, it's unrighteous, it is uh, punitive in nature, and um, we really uh, need to have this change modified so we can go on our way, uh, so we can worship God according to our conscience. And if you could allow that and uh, follow, the, you know, in, in the spirit of amicable separation and as drawn up in the paragraph 2553 of the Book of Discipline, if you could open ways for us to lead peacefully and in, in an amicable way. I really appreciate that. And if you could, after the annual conference, uh, you know, allow us time to sit down with you, have conversation, and, and uh, come up with a resolution that we can work with. I really appreciate that. Thank you for considering. So that's how she wraps up this speech. This saga is not over, by the way, but she, she pitched it perfectly to show how this is not having the intended effect of punishing the bigots that voted for Trump in the Midwest. This is punishing ethnic minorities uh, in coastal regions. Um, so that's, that's something that should not feel right in the, the minds and hearts of progressives leading the conference. And she appeals to Bishop Escobita Frank's uh, uh, conscience, you know, you could be kind, you could help us out here. And she, she just lobs the ball at her so she can, uh, hit it out of the park. Um, I, I also think there's wisdom in the last thing she said, she appeals to conscience, which of course, um, goes back to the roots of, uh, Protestantism, here I stand, I can do no other. Martin Luther, how can I possibly be expected to participate in this institution that just, is so wrong in my understanding, but also appealing to this uh, language of amicable separation. This is something that uh, has been Methodist speak for a couple of years now, ever since the protocol came out, saying, hey, let's do a better job at splitting than these other denominations. Let's, let's love one another. Let's be good to one another as we part ways. So let's, let's be real clear. As she promotes, as she's asking for the bishop to help revise these terms and, and make a more just and equitable, amicable solution for these lower income, or maybe just normal income people. The next guy is going to show just how outlandish this request is um, of the Conference Board of Trustees. If the bishop wanted to, she could help, but spoiler alert, she doesn't want to, and she's not going to. So let's, let's look at her first reaction, and then you're going to get some more. So thank she stays close comments. just in case, but uh, no, for. thanks for your comments. Yes, thank you, Bishop, and annual conference. I am Glenn Hayworth, clergy from Fountain Valley in the South District, and I have a motion I'd like to propose. Go ahead. Okay. I move that the California Pacific Annual Conference instructs the Conference Board of Trustees to negotiate with disaffiliating churches in the conference for the purpose of arriving at a more equitable and reasonable formula 
for disaffiliation than the current guidelines specify, and that specifically the trustees consider reducing substantially the 50 percent of property value currently required of local churches which have voted to disaffiliate, and that these negotiations conclude no later than October 1st, 2023. If I have a second, I'd like to speak to it. Is there a second? As Sister Helena just said. Um, so keep in mind, annual conference is a really tense place. And on their shoulders, they are surely feeling the anxiety and the tension that's been building up for decades across the connection. But also, especially in this annual conference season across the United States, it's a very tense time and there's a lot of resentment. I'm really in awe of this gentleman, too, who's just very calm. Uh, he's not giving away. He's, he's the epitome of a non-anxious presence, which is what uh, clergy are going for, but so frequently fail at. If you saw my... Um, uh, Last couple videos, the one from Baltimore, Washington annual conference was really bad. They did not good, at the, did not do well to the non-anxious presence. If you saw the East Ohio one with the Holy Hex prayer, I mean that's that's the stuff that people have in their heads as they imagine annual conference. What what I loved about this clip that I'm showing you is just how calm and measured and mature. And I, I mean, heck, if this isn't holy, I don't know what is. And to see how that is responded to by institutional forces is very illuminating. The requirement to pay 50% of the property value in order to disaffiliate effectively closes the door for basically all of the churches. I have to ask the clergy and the laity here, could your church pay 50% of your property value? My church has 50 members. We're in Fountain Valley. The property is valued at $6 million, which means that the 50 members of my church, in order to disaffiliate, would be required to come up with $3 million. That's $60,000 per member, if you're quick with math. And it's just impossible. We can't. Isn't math fun? Is this in any world? A fair proposal, something that's fair to ask of churches. It's so outlandishly, cartoonishly unjust, which which he highlights so perfectly in something close to monotone. Um, there, there is no way to stretch this. Where I mean, some institutionalists would say, "Well, you know, this is the fair share that our board of trustees have reached." You know, this is highway robbery. It's extortion. This is. This is there's no world in which someone can look at this seriously and go, oh yeah, yeah, that sounds fair and equitable. And man, this guy is highlighting it perfectly. I can't even get a mortgage loan uh, because our income to debt ratio would be too high, um, and plus the payments on that would be twenty six thousand dollars per month, which is effectively our our entire budget. So I asked this conference to simply nudge the trustees into negotiating and coming to a formula that is more equitable and fair and just for churches that simply want to be let go and simply to worship in the way that they believe is right. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. So the, the general motion, as I understand it, is that the Conference Board of Trustees be asked by the the conference as a whole to say, hey, the terms we came up with are not great. Let's reduce this highly burdensome fee for the exit so that congregations that need to be somewhere else can go somewhere else. A completely reasonable thing to request. How on earth would you refuse such a request? Well, let's see. Glenn, and for your motion, what I want to say is that um, I wanted to let you uh, speak and also the, your previous uh, speaker to, to share what they are thinking, but I, I'm going to rule that out of order, and I'm going to cite Judicial Council Decision 1420, 1457, and 1458. So what she's doing here is saying, we're, we're not going to even take a vote on this. I'm calling it out of order. Here are three Judicial Council decisions saying why it is that, that uh, we really can't vote on this. The annual conference should not be telling the Board of Ordain, no, Board of Trustees what to do, how to act. Um, we're not going to take a vote on this. I let you speak. I was happy to let you speak. We're not going to bring this to a vote is what she's saying. 
the conference board of trustees has made their decision. They have addressed it twice in their meeting, and we are going to continue with the disaffiliation agreement under paragraph 2553.4. But thank you for speaking up and for letting us know. We do pray for you and for the churches, and we ask that you, um, and we pray that you will find your way as you make the decisions you have to make. So we're not going to reconsider. We've already considered twice. We like our decision. And you know what? Let's pray that you find your way. Now, there is a scripture very much like this, and it's in the book of James, and I'm going to butcher it, but I'll, I'll remember to put an actual quote on here. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Right. What good is your prayer when you haven't fed them? When you have the means to help and yet you choose not to, that is sin. That is sin. So what the bishop is doing right here, does the bishop have the ability to help these people? Absolutely she does. Absolutely. She could let this come to a vote and uh, let the assembly speak for itself, see how many of these people really feel good about holding these congregations against their will. She could just unilaterally decide as bishop, hey, you know what? We're going to go back. This obviously isn't working. Board of Trustees, I'm going to lead them through a new discernment process. We're going to figure out a way that you guys don't get trapped in the, the denomination. What would happen if she did that? Nothing. Judicial counsel is not going to correct her, and even if they did, she would be right in her conscience for making such a decision. But what she's posturing at is here, hey, we've gone through the process. Judicial counsel ties our hands behind our back. There's really nothing we can do. You're just going to have to live, learn to live with it. So I pray for you. I pray that you find your way, even though I'm the one blocking the way out. So that's just not—it's a, a very disingenuous, I would say, an unholy and— uh, a uh, skevia word. It's it's not. It, it's icky. It's an icky response because she is clearly the gatekeeper that is holding these people against their will. Even if she doesn't want to publicly identify as that, um, she fully has the authority. You know why I say that? Because bishops do whatever they want and they do just fine. You know, their bishops make all kind of calls across the connection. Nothing bad ever happens to any of them. She totally could be fair in this event if she wanted to. She does not want to. They do? Yes, so that means that this conference has authority over the Board of Trustees. No, the discipline has the authority over the Board of Trustees. Correct. But this is not a place for discussion. It's just so a let's question. move on, but um, you know, so he's, he's making a, a logical argument, and these things are not welcome anymore, but to the, the final voice of the denomination, well, the, the, the primary unit of the United Methodist Church is the annual conference, and the Board of Trustees serves the annual conference, and yet, the, because of Judicial Council rulings, we created this scenario where we elect individuals who then rule over us without accountability. We can't correct them. We can't change what they do. So it really is, this, and, and it's not just the Board of Trustees, it's, it's the bishops as well. You, they are elected, but then they're not really accountable. The accountability structures for them don't really operate, and so bishops do as they like, and then they instruct the boards of, ordain, of trustees to do as they want them to do, and there's really no other recourse so um, it's, it's, a, it's for all to see a corrupt institution, and, and this is exactly what it looks like. Um, it couldn't be any more clear to, to me. I, I don't know if, if, if a dispassionate person on the outside viewed this. I do think that they would be very confused. Okay, wait, this is a conciliar government, and yet the council cannot decide the terms on which people can leave the council? That's just a very odd scenario that seems pretty blatantly concerned with maintaining institutional clout. I, I, I have no trouble talking to people, so let's, if you want to talk to me on the side with trustees, you can, but it's really not 
this, this is not the place to do that. Um, I think we need to move on in our, in our um, meeting and, um, but you have opened up something that I think we should stop for a moment and say a prayer for those churches who are really struggling and need to make some decisions. None of them are easy. So let's, let's take a moment uh, to pray together as a body. God, we know that um, as a family of Christ, we don't agree and we are going through a difficult time now with disaffiliations and we recognize Well, my audio cut out, and that was not intentional, but um, it is what it is. You can guess that the the prayer was not satisfactory whatsoever. And the, the really odd thing, the final thing to say about this clip is to say this is not the place for discussion. The thing is that the annual conference was designed to be a place of discussion. And even though we might, um, you know, it's funny, we were a Holy Spirit-oriented people, that yes, we came out of the Anglican Church and we had an order of service and there was an expected order that we did things. But even so, when you follow the Spirit, that means that your plans don't always go as you plan. A plan is something you deviate from. And so a, a council needs to be able to reserve the right to have the conversation that it needs to have in order to function well. What you just saw was a picture of dis function, where the people at the top decide what you can and cannot talk about, what what time and space there is for certain conversations, and she says, oh, I can talk outside of this, but this really isn't the place for it. It's just a radically disingenuous way to be in relationship. It's, it's um, trampling underfoot individual congregations with the might of the behemoth organization that's been created. It's exactly why local churches want to leave. Even if they don't have a dog in the, the, the far left, far, far right thing, a lot of churches with just sober eyes, clear eyes, don't want to be a part of an institution that behaves this way. And so you have in this picture um, ethnic minority, very respectful, stepping up and saying, you're stepping on us. You have older uh, very measured gentleman stepping up and saying, this is clearly unjust, let's do something about it. And then you have the voice of the institution stepping up and saying, no, we're going to pray for you. We can't talk about this anymore. And that is a fundamentally unjust, unsatisfying uh, way to be in relationship. I, I can't believe that so many people still take this institution as seriously as they do when it seems... Um, to so many to just be an institution concerned only with self-preservation and secondarily advancing a political agenda um, at the expense of the consciences of anyone who stands in the way. They could not be any more um, unconcerned with the plight that they're putting these churches in. So I don't, I don't, you know, usually I try and be more measured in my speech. This is, uh, this particular situation is not one that requires a measured response. I, I don't think, that, well, you know, she has institutional concerns to keep in mind, and, you know, what do you really expect her to do? I, I think that, that any sort of devil's advocate approach to this particular situation is just completely unnecessary and silly. It is silly to pretend that, that this particular situation or the situation in Baltimore, Washington, any situation in which the price to, to leave is just prohibitively... Um, exorbitantly wrong. To, to imagine that that is a, a situation where there's a both sides, hey, you know, there's pros and cons to each one. And that's just silly. There's clearly a right and a wrong here. And if you don't see it, it's because you're compromised. So I'll pray for you. How does that feel? All right, let's, uh, let's end this one. I'll see you again soon, though. Bye.